I want you guys to think with me. What is one life worth? Take a second to think of the answer to, to that question. What is one life worth? Now reconsider your answer when considering what is the life of the Son of God worth? There are so many what ifs that surround that question. Do I know that he is the Son of God? Do I know the prophecies that foretell of his coming and what he will have to suffer from my redemption? Do I see him as he is? Or is my vision clouded by what I hope he would be? Truly, there is nothing that can prepare you for a right response to that question but Scripture. Today, we see that very life hanging in the balance. And it's important to recount and fully understand how we got here. Having been through the majority of the Gospel of Matthew already, what do we know? We know that Jesus of Nazareth alone is God in the flesh, the God-man, the Son of God, having been conceived by the Spirit and born of a virgin. We know that his cousin, John the Baptist, came before him as a forerunner to prepare the way. And he came preach in the wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know that the same cousin, John the Baptist, baptized him in the Jordan River to fulfill all righteousness, ushering in Jesus' earthly ministry. And God the Father was well pleased with his son after his baptism. We know that Jesus was tempted in the desert by Satan after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. But unlike Adam, did not fall, fall into sin. Instead, he turned back every temptation attempt by answering with the word of God. We know that he too came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that he came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. We know that while preaching, he also performed countless miracles and many heard and saw and believed, but he also exposed the self-righteous hearts and hypocrisy of many, including the Jewish leaders of the day. We know that over the three year span of his earthly ministry, their jealousy and animosity towards him grew so much that the Jewish leaders plotted, schemed and invented ways to incriminate him in hopes of ensuring his execution. And we know that with the betraying assistance of Judas Iscariot, he went from having the Passover dinner with his disciples to praying in the Garden of Gethsemane under so much stress that his soul was sorrowful even unto death, to being betrayed and then arrested by a mob consisting of Roman soldiers and Levitical temple police, to seeing scripture fulfilled as his disciples scattered like sheep. And this was just the beginning. The next 15 hours of Jesus' life would be grueling, unlike anything known to man. He would be falsely accused, lied on, unofficially condemned to death by the Jewish religious leaders. He'd be struck, spit on, and slapped by them thereafter, and all this before daybreak. The next morning, he would stand trial before the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, who would find no fault in him, but he would still be officially condemned to death. He would then be handed over to the Roman soldiers to be scourged and then delivered up to be crucified. And this is where we pick up his journey this morning. If you have your Bibles, open them and turn them to Matthew 27. This morning, we will seek to unpack three biblical, definitive, and historical facts about the crucifixion of Jesus. The first fact is that Jesus is our perfect substitute. He is our perfect substitute. And if you like taking notes, that's in verses 27 through 44 of Matthew 27. Secondly, we'll examine why he is the only satisfaction for our sin why his death is the only satisfaction for our sins, verses 45 through 50. And then lastly, we'll understand why he is the only way we can be reconciled to God, 
and that's in verses 51 through 66. So look with me now in verses 27 as we uncover the first fact, Jesus as our perfect substitute. Picking up in verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now, having already reset the scene for us earlier, we now know at this point that Jesus had been robbed of his peace, of his rest and his dignity. He had been falsely accused. There were trumped up charges being brought against him. He had been scourged to the point of being unrecognizable. And this weakened him almost to the point of death. What was scourging? I was telling the elders earlier, I really hoped that um, Bill Lane had covered this at length, but I guess I'm up. <laughs> scourging was a brutal punishment that was standard before crucifixion. The whip, known as a flagellum, used for scourging had several strands, each strand as much as three feet long, weighted with either lead balls or pieces of bone attached to it. It was designed to lacerate, to cut through human flesh, opening the man's flesh with each lash, exposing muscle and tissue, even to the innermost veins and arteries. The beating left the victim bloody and weak in unimaginable pain and near the point of death. The person to be whipped was stripped of his clothing, tied to a post or pillar, and beaten until his flesh hung in shreds. That's what our Lord endured for us. It was the worst kind of flogging administered by ancient courts. While the Jews administered whippings in the synagogues for certain offenses, these were mild in comparison to scourging. Scourging was not normally a form of ex ex execution, but it was brutal enough to be fatal in many cases. Its purpose was not only to cause great pain, but to humiliate as well. To scourge a man was to beat him worse than you would beat a senseless animal. It was belittling debasing and demeaning. It was considered such a degrading form of punishment. It was exempt from Roman citizens. It was therefore the punishment appropriate only for slaves and non-Romans, those who were viewed as the lesser elements in Roman society. And to make it as humiliating as possible, it was done in public. This is what Pilate had done to Jesus before sending him to be crucified. And now at the governor's mansion, he was under the mocking and persecution of the whole battalion assigned to the governor, which could have been anywhere from 150 to 200 men. Known for their merciless and sadistic games with condemned prisoners, they treated him like a criminal. Knowing the false charges being brought against him, they stripped him of his clothing and replaced him with a scarlet robe. Matthew says they put a crown of thorns on his head that they made, but the reality is it was more than likely mashed onto his scalp. And then to add the finishing touch, they put a reed in his hand as if it was his royal scepter and mockingly kneeled before him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Not one person, but up to 200 did that. The irony though, is that their actions exemplified the truth they were crucifying a king, but not just any king. The sinless king of glory was being put to death as if he had committed the most heinous crimes. Continuing to seek ruthless pleasure at his expense, the soldiers spit on him and hit him on the head with the reed, which was more than likely made of wood. And if the mocking wasn't enough, they then stripped him of the robe put his clothing back on him and led him away to be crucified. And just to think, 
this wasn't even the worst of his suffering. Look with me at verse 32, please. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept a watch over him there. So the battalion led him away from the governor's mansion to Golgotha to crucify him. But after being scorched, he was too weak to carry his cross. Normally 30 or 40 pounds heavy and an unbalanced weight, the Lord's severely weakened condition made, him, made it impossible for him to carry it. Not only would he have lost mounds of blood, but the skin and muscles on his back would have been shredded and his internal organs likely compromised and starting to shut down. Seeing this, Matthew says the soldiers compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. But I don't know, man, that's just, that's far too gentle. I feel like Luke's gospel more fully describes what happened. Luke 23, 26 says, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. He wasn't given much of a choice. Compelling is like, hey, Greg, you want to help me with this cross? Yeah, no. They grabbed that man and told him, this is what you're going to do. They had him carry Jesus' cross to Golgotha, a place outside of the city walls. It was both Jewish and Roman custom to crucify here instead of within the walls, both with different significances. The Romans wanted those condemned to die to serve as a spectacle, an example of the consequence of challenging Roman authority. But the Jews were different. They associated holiness and purity with places. So they wanted the execution done outside of the city where the unclean were dealt with. Not only had Jesus been scourged and at this point headed to be crucified, but it's important not to miss the relevance of the intangible of perception here. It wasn't by accident that Jesus was being crucified, executed for the sins of the world, since he did not commit. It wasn't by accident that scourging was standard practice before crucifixion. It wasn't by accident that scourging was only appropriate for slaves and those seen as less than. And it wasn't by accident that Jesus was being treated as unclean by being crucified outside the city even though he was sinless, this was customary. The question is why? Well, God hates sin and is faithful and just to judge it. In his providence, what Jesus was suffering, even down to these humiliating fine details, is both the stored up wrath of God towards sin and his love for his covenant people being put on display by causing Jesus to bear the great burden of paying the penalty for our sins. And we'll continue to see that build as we draw closer to the climax of this passage. When they arrived at Golgotha, the soldiers offered Jesus wine and drink mixed with gall, but he would not drink it. This was for two reasons. The first is because this would have had a mild numbing effect, which would have taken a slight edge off the physical pain he was experiencing but that wasn't the Father's will. The second reason was because gall was a bitter herb that could even be poisonous, and dying before going to the cross to suffer was not how God had preordained Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. In verse 35 it says, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Now all four gospel accounts say relatively the same thing about his crucifixion. Not much at all. This was probably because crucifixion was the most common form of Roman execution during that time. But there was nothing common about it. It was widely considered to be the worst form of Roman execution due to the combination of torturous pain and public shame. The Jews looked upon it with horror because the Mosaic law declares, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree. And yet, 
Here was the Lord of glory about to suffer the full wrath of God for crimes and sins that he never committed. Being crucified, the soldiers nailed him above his wrist on the horizontal part of the beam. And his feet were placed one on top of the other and then nailed to the vertical part of the beam, hanging on the cross. Not only did he feel the weight of his body as he hung suspended by his arms, making it ever increasingly difficult to breathe, but he would have come to know intimately, intimately, the full weight of his father's wrath inflicted upon him for the sins of the world. And any attempt to find physical relief by pushing up with his feet, take the weight off his arms, was quickly nullified as the excruciating pain shifted to his feet, to his arms, his legs, and his back. To be crucified meant to be met with extreme pain, exhaustion that was overwhelming from trying to support one's body, and eventual death by suffocation, if not by physical trauma first. And this was the will of the Father, for the Son to be crushed to purchase our salvation. Having nailed Jesus to the cross and erected it for all to see, with his body broken, naked, and beaten, and his appearance marred beyond human semblance. The soldiers casted lots for his clothing, dividing them amongst themselves. This was to fulfill what the, what the prophet King David said about him in Psalm 22, 18. Picking up in verse 37, it says, and over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Having been betrayed, arrested, deserted, denied, mocked, hit, spit on, slapped, officially tried, scourged, and now hung up on a cross and crucified. The Romans made a point to put the charge against Jesus above his head on the cross to deter anyone from attempting to rise up against Rome. They sought to protect their power and authority at any cost, even at the expense of a lie and innocent man and crucified. Jesus was a spectacle for all to see and many thought he was getting what he deserved. Since he was crucified outside of, outside of the city walls, those passing by probably included many pilgrims in town for the Passover. No doubt they had heard about the man Jesus and were more than happy to take shots at him in derision, calling into question his deity as the son of God by challenging him to save himself. The chief priests and elders also joined in in insulting him for the same reason one last time before he breathed his last. And the robbers being crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So at this point, we can answer the question, what made and makes Jesus our perfect substitute? The sinless son of God, who left his throne of glory in heaven and condescended, coming down to a people who would sooner kill him than worship him who did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. The one who the writer of the book of Hebrews declared was tempted in every way, but did not sin. He was hung up on the tree, bearing the cross and the shame, becoming a curse for us, dying a sinner's death on behalf of those who were his enemy. What makes him our perfect substitute? The answers in the details. In order to truly answer that question, we need to first answer the question, why? 
why do we even need a substitute? The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 3.23, he says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. And while this may seem simple to all of you who are no doubt well-churched, right, who have been under good teaching, good preaching from Pastor Nick, and very fundamental in nature, it doesn't excuse the fact that God requires a standard of perfect law keeping that we cannot meet as sinners. Because of that, there lies a great void between God and man, but also all, all of mankind remains under the wrath of God unless, and I say unless in all caps, the penalty is paid in full for our sinful rebellion. That penalty is death. Our death though, if we die in our sins without the perfect work of Jesus Christ being, applied, being, being applied to our lives by faith would be an eternal one. We would pay for a life of sinfulness and worldliness with eternal judgment. Therefore, none of what happened to Jesus happened outside of the Father's providential will. Now enter Jesus Christ the righteous and sinless Savior who the words of scripture make clear is our perfect substitute. He is perfect because God put him forward as our Passover lamb. Looking back with me briefly at Matthew 26, 27 and 28, when Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples, it says, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now to remind you, the Passover meal was celebrated annually by the nation of Israel in remembrance of the original Passover in Egypt, while they were still being held captive as slaves to, to, to the Egyptians. At the first pa Passover, excuse me, God judged every home, both Egyptian and Israelite, that did not have the blood of a spotless lamb above its doorpost. Those who did, the spirit of death passed over and their firstborn, firstborn son was spared. But those who didn't lost their firstborn son. The blood of this lamb was provided by God as a substitutionary sacrifice or atonement to save the people Israel from his just wrath payment for sin. Jesus makes reference to this very thing in verse 28 when he says that his blood is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So now on the cross, he had become our perfect substitute, our Passover lamb, who had been sacrificed by God through the evil and malicious intent of the Jewish religious leaders to atone for our sins. In verse 28 of Matthew 26, Jesus wasn't using this verbiage as a point of reference, but to give fuller context of the moment to come. God the Father had supplied him, God the Son, as the spotless, sinless lamb to shed his blood, to give his life as a ransom for many for our forgiveness of sins and for our salvation. As 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And this leads us to the second biblical, definitive, and historical fact about the crucifixion of Jesus. And that is Jesus' death is the only satisfaction for our sins. Look with me at verse 45, please. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Up to this point, 
Jesus had suffered in silence. He had been the butt of mockery and reviling, whether it was at Caiaphas' headquarters, the praetorium, or now on the cross. But now Matthew shifts the focus onto Jesus himself. And we are given a greater perspective and understanding of the significance of his suffering on the cross. He was crucified at 9 a.m. And from nine until noon, he hung in the sunlight. But at noon, a miraculous darkness covered the land. This was not an eclipse since Passover occurred during the full moon. No, this was a sign of God's displeasure and judgment on the sin of all humanity. What is interesting is there were three days of darkness in Egypt before Passover. And there were three hours of darkness before the Lamb of God died for the sins of the world. And I believe this, there was a dual, re dual reason behind the three hours of darkness. First, God judging his son for our sins, not for his. And second, equally a wake-up call to mankind who had spurned his son and nailed him to a cross to the horrible reality of the judgment of God to all who do, who do not believe in the work of his son. What is also interesting is that Jesus had spoken at least three times before darkness fell. In Luke 23, 34, while they were nailing him to the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Also in Luke 23, he spoke to the repentant thief and assured him of place in paradise. And then in John 19, he gave his mother to John, the disciple he loved to care for. But when the darkness fell, he was silent for three hours. And after three hours, the darkness lifted and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was during this time of darkness that he had been made sin for us, that the father crushed him for our iniquities, laying on him the iniquity of us all. And his words declared he had been forsaken by the father. The father turned his back on him, severing all communication while the son hung in agony, suffering the fullness of the wrath of God that should have been spent on all of mankind. And his extraordinary cry put on display the depth of his suffering as he became a ransom for many. The darkness was a symbol of the judgment he endured when he was made a curse for us. And notice too, that this was the only time that Jesus does not address God as father. An indication that during this time, even the most intimate relationship of father and son had been broken. I like how one commentator put it. He said, in some sense, Jesus had to be cut off from the favor and fellowship with the father that had been his eternally because he was bearing the sins of his people and therefore enduring God's wrath. In quoting Psalm 22, 1, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus probably had in mind the remainder of the psalm as well, which moves on to a cry of victory. And he expresses this faith by calling God the Father, my God. When Jesus cried out, he spoke in Hebrew, and the spectators did not understand him. They thought he was calling on Elijah for help. Quickly thereafter, he spoke three more times. He said, I thirst, in John 19, 28, fulfilling Psalm 69, 21. Someone heard him and kindly moistened his lips with sour wine while the others waited to see if Elijah would come help him. Then he shouted words that you and I love to hear. It is finished in John 1930. And then lastly, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit in Luke 23, 46. And he breathes, breathes his last uh, breath, just as Jesus said he would. He laid down his life. No one took it from him. He was in complete control of his faculties and voluntarily gave up his spirit and died. He had fulfilled the law by obeying it perfectly. He had fulfilled the prophets by fulfilling prophecies about himself as Messiah. He even willingly went to the cross to pay the eternal punishment 
as the perfect substitute for our sins. And in doing so, he fully satisfied the just wrath of God, becoming our propitiation. Not just that, though. When he died, he enacted the new covenant in his blood that he mentioned at the Passover dinner with his disciples, which is spoken of by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Salvation, as it had always been, would be by grace alone, through faith alone. But since the curse had been paid in full when Jesus paid the ransom for our sins with his blood, and guilt would no longer be our master or have a stronghold on us, and since Jesus fulfilled the promises of the Abrahamic covenant as the offspring through whom all the nations would, would be blessed by faith, and the Davidic covenant, by being the eternal king, we no longer have to look forward anticipating a coming Messiah in types and shadows. For not only has he come, but he has come, conquered. And since we know how the story ends, he has risen and risen indeed. And this leads to the third and final biblical definitive and historical fact about his crucifixion. He alone is the only way to be reconciled to God. Look with me at verse 51, please. It says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. As soon as Jesus gave up his spirit and died, three miraculous signs occurred that put on display that his death was not ordinary. First, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This was the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. It was an elaborately woven fa fabric that was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. The greater significance was that no one, in all caps, no one, was allowed to enter the most holy place behind the curtain but the high priest, and only once a year on the Day of the Atonement. But the rending of this curtain symbolized the removal of the separation between God and all who believe through the death of God, the Son, Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, there was no more need of priests, of altars, or sacrifices. Because Jesus died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. And now we have full access through him. Second, the earth shook and the rocks were split, causing tombs to be open. And many saints who, were, who had died were raised and appeared to many after Jesus' resurrection. This was both a display of God's power and judgment, but also a foretaste of what awaits every believer 
when he returns. Notice that those who were raised didn't appear to many until after Jesus' resurrection. Their resurrection couldn't have happened without his. He alone is the firstborn of many brethren, and their resurrection along with ours would not be possible without his actual death and his resurrection. The third miraculous sign was the result of the first two, combined with the character they saw Jesus display of self-control, grace, and love. And that sign was the response of the centurion and those with him keeping watch over Jesus. They said, truly, this was the Son of God. Their confession says a lot. But while this did not warrant saving faith, it does indicate a great awareness and potentially open heart to the truth that Jesus was the Christ who died so that we might live in him. The miracle, though, here is that once again, God allowed the Gentiles to see what, what Jesus' Jewish persecutors could, could not. This, along with the love displayed by the women who were present, looking on from a distance, and Joseph of Arimathea, who assured Jesus a proper burial, was in stark contrast to the chief priests and Pharisees who broke the Sabbath to ensure that Jesus was properly disposed of. Still insulting him by calling him an imposter, they remembered what his disciples had not, that he said he would rise in three days, and they were petrified. Although they said they were afraid of his disciples stealing him and the last fraud being worse than, than the first, after the events from the previous day, they were obviously afraid that they had put the son of the living God to death and sought a way to secure his tomb. But all of this was of God's sovereignty because it both prevented anyone from stealing his body, friend or foe, and simultaneously helped prove the resurrection of Jesus by ensuring his tomb was sealed and guarded by soldiers. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His death made this possible. It eliminated the dividing wall that stood between God and man because he satisfied the wrath of God by paying the penalty for our sin. And now by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we can be saved, justified, and reconciled to God. The beauty is that none of this is based on our merit. We do not need to, nor can we, earn a right standing before holy God. Our righteousness is but filthy rags before holy God. Instead, our salvation required an alien righteousness, once that, one that originated outside of us. This kind of righteousness could only come from God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. As the apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the sin of some the sinless son of God had to become sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become his righteousness. Like the chief priest, the elders, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, the world over stands opposed to this Jesus. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why? Why are we so prone to hate the very one who came to save us? More importantly, will you be like Joseph of Arimathea and the women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, looking on from a distance at his crucifixion and were the first at his tomb, or be like the Jewish, Jewish leaders? One loved the light and did what was true, putting their trust on display while one loved the darkness instead of the light because it works for evil. You decide. Let us pray. Father, it's good to be broken. It's good to see our sin for what it is, an abomination before holy God. It's good to feel the weight and the gravity of our sin. It's good to know with great conviction that if we rely on our own strength, on our own merits, on our own works, 
that the end result will mean we perish, we suffer your eternal wrath. But it's also good to know, Lord, that you, O oh God, pay the penalty for our sins, that you, O oh God, stepped into time and space and gave your life as a ransom to free us, to redeem us, to ransom us, to ensure that we can spend eternity with you. And I pray that we not lose sight of that today, tomorrow, next week, this month, forever. I pray that and instead we hold fast to what is true. That we hold fast to the great reminder that Christ came to redeem sinners of which we are the foremost. I pray that you bless us in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.